And I'm going to speak about um, the experience of separated um, young, young people in Ireland. So um, this is based on a study that I conducted, which I'll tell you a little bit about. Um, obviously, I'm conscious that these are a very particular group of ethnic minority children, and probably most of you don't work with separated children and won't work with separated children. But at the same, I think that a lot of the lessons in terms of um, that we ha can learn from what they have to say are relevant to a lot of um, ethnic minority young, young people. So hopefully you'll feel, you'll feel that the, the presentation is relevant in that sense. Okay, so just uh, probably everyone knows, but in case anyone doesn't, what, what we mean by separated children. So separated children or unaccompanied um, minors or unaccompanied children are children or young people who are under the age of 18 who are separated from their legal or customary caregiver and who are outside of their country of origin. They don't necessarily have to be asylum seekers. Sometimes there's a perception that they must be in the asylum process. That mightn't be the appropriate um, process for them to go through. But in, our, in the Irish context, they generally tend to go into the asylum process at some point. Um, so in terms of um, separated children in the Irish context, the first record we have of separated children arriving in Ireland was in 1996. And since then, there were increasing numbers up until 2001, which was around the time that I worked on the separated children's team. And then since then, there, has been, there was a decline. Um, there has been a little bit of an increase again. For example, the number of children arriving in the country this year has, is double um, in, the, in the period compared to the same period last year. Um, and there's a possibility, I guess, that there will be a future increase in the number of separated children arriving either through, through on their own independently or through resettlement or relocation schemes that are being, being discussed. So the Minister for Justice, um, or the outgoing Minister for Justice, I'm not sure really what she is at the moment, um, she would have talked about the, the need to prioritise um, the needs of unaccompanied minors in the resettlement schemes that the, the government were, were discussing. Um, through because of the EU migration crisis. So in terms of care of separated ch children, they've predominantly, they predominantly lived in hostile care until 2010. So you might, you're probably aware of the fact that this received a lot of criticism in the sense that these young people were in these huge hostels. Um, there were, in some instances, in the worst hostels, there were maybe 12 young people sharing a room. There was very little supervision. And while and, this, and I, I worked as a social worker when this was the case with, with these young people. But we've moved um, a long way um, since then. And the, the service that we now provide for separated children is seen as one of the best services in Europe in the sense that the vast majority um, of separated children now go into foster care. Um, and if they don't go into foster care, they're in residential care or supported lodging. So the, it's, we don't have this um, system um, of hostile care anymore. So we basically have a mix of um, residential care at reception. So when young people arrive in the country now, they generally, most of them are over 12. And if they're over 12, they're placed in residential care, specific um, residential units for these young people. And following a period of assessment, they then go on usually to foster care or supported lodgings. And a small number would go on to, to um, a longer term residential unit. And I know that there's um, someone here from the separate children's team, so if there's anything I say that's incorrect, you can, you can let me know. Um, so in terms of the context of the study, so this study was uh, funded by uh, Bernardo's and the HSE, um, and it, the, the, the context of it was that the hostels had closed down and we had moved into this, what has been called and was referred to earlier as equity of care. Okay, so a system whereby these young people were getting, if you like, the same treatment as um, Irish young people in the care system. The methodology was um, qualitative, um, so it involved face-to-face -face interviews with young people and with foster carers um, or supported lodgings carers and then telephone interviews with um, service providers and I also, we also um, had a focus group. So there were 69 participants, 21 young people. So these were, um, 18 of these were still in foster care. Three of them had previously been in foster care and now had aged out. So most of them were, were under the age of 18 and were still in foster care. 16 carers and then 32 stakeholders. Okay, so I'm going to give you a small bit of information first about just the general things people said, the young people said, primarily I'm focusing on the young people, I'm going to focus on what they said about foster care, 
uh, generally, but then I'm going to hone in a little bit more on issues around diversity and specifically, I think, which is related more to the, to the theme of, of today's conference. Um, so in terms of living in a family placement, a lot of the things that the young people said would be consistent with what young people in research studies would say about foster care in general. Okay? So there, a lot of the, the things that their experiences of foster care were very like the experiences that we might have of Irish children in the care system or children in other um, international contexts. Um, so these young people, because they had to, they, the system was that they would go into residential care first and then move on to foster care, there were, were some issues around transitioning from one to the other. So, and I suppose this is something that I know that I would ha have the belief that actually when the separate children arrive in Ireland, they could be placed in foster care immediately instead of going into residential care. But I know that there are different perspectives on that and that I think Tusla would be of the opinion that it's better to put them in residential care first so that we can do a thorough assessment of their needs and so on, given that we generally know very little about the young people who are arriving. So it's, it's something that I think that's up for debate. So when the young people were placed in residential care and then moved on to foster care, sometimes difficulties arose there. They became used to the kind of care you receive in residential care, and they had maybe the same expectations then when they went into foster care. So, for example, one foster family talked about the fact that, you know, these young people, they were used to being cared for by residential staff who tended to be, much, who tended to be quite young, so maybe, you know, people in their 20s, and now they were moving to place, be cared for by a family where maybe the carers are much older, or in residential care there was a lot of maybe resources available for out and so on and in the foster family that mightn't be the case so there were some challenges in relation to that at the same time the young people were very positive about their experiences of living in residential care so that's important to note in terms of family care then the positive aspects the general kind of positive aspects were things around appreciating the efforts made by carers being treated like family and um, they talked about carers who were listening who were encouraging being there for them, advocating for them. So again, a lot of the things that would be similar to the general population of children in care. And then challenges relating to things like the location of placements. So for example, maybe the placement was in a rural area and the young person wanted to be in a city. So bearing in mind that most of these young people are 15, 16, 17 year olds. Um, issues around food, um, that, that, which I guess could be to do with culture, but it equally could be to do with just you go and live in someone else's house and the food isn't the same as the, the food that you're used to. Um, rules, um, again, quite typical in terms of adolescence. Personality clashes, so just the fact that there maybe wasn't a good fit between the young person and the carer in terms of personality. Composition of family, so things like that the young people, one young person talked about the fact that all the kids in the foster family were much younger and that it was like a kid's house and he was an adolescent and just that didn't fit very well. Not living with, obviously challenges that they're not living with their own family and then as I said the general challenges of adolescence. Um, okay, so I'm not going to read out all these quotes. They're in, many of them are in your, or they're in your um, presentation. This, I think you have them in your pack. So this young person just talked about the fact that he was brought to the daughter's wedding. So they brought me to their daughter's wedding. So they said, the family has to go to a wedding. So you're part of our family. So you can come with us. Okay, so appreciating being part of the family. Um, this young person who was one of the younger participants in the study said about the foster family keeping him safe. So make sure, keep you safe, come in before dark in case bad people come and take you, stuff like that. Okay, and then recognising that while the young people wanted to fit into the family, um, they also wanted to have a balance between fitting in and the carers not assuming the role of their parents. Okay, so foster care, the foster care is not your mum. So like if it's your mum, she understands every single thing about you, she knows you inside out because she's your mum. And you know there are some things your foster care can't do for you like your mum can do for you. Okay. So to move on then to the looking, I suppose, at the family placements and context and particularly around diversity. So we t Anne talked earlier about the importance of continuity. Um, and again, for these young people, when, we, when I interviewed them, this was really important to them, the, the idea of having a sense of continuity. So if you imagine the fact that these young people have really had 
the threads of their life, the, the kind of narrative in their life has been ruptured. So they've, you know, come from a very different context. They've moved to this country that's probably perceived to be very different. And um, they're in care, they're away from their family. They, might, they may have experienced um, war or conflict or some, some kind of persecution in their country of origin. So there's a huge amount of discontinuity, if you like, in their lives. So they therefore appreciated having a sense of some continuity within that, uh, that context. So they talked about, and I'll give you some examples, things like importance of food, and that's been emphasised in the literature in, in relation to migration, that food plays a very important role, and it was mentioned earlier as well. Language, um, religion, and values. So I guess what's slightly different from in this study compared to Anne's study, in Anne's study, I think I'm right to say, Anne, that all the, people, the young people were placed with Irish carers. So in this study, that, that was different. So of the 18 young people who were in care at the time of the study, um, 10 of them were, li had be were living with either an Irish couple or um, an Irish person who was parenting alone. Okay, so 10 of them. So that meant that eight of them were living in other families, not Irish families. Now, I think it's a little bit maybe simplistic to say they were matched culturally because I think that's a really complex idea that you, you're matching someone culturally. Um, so, for example, if you know I'm, I'm originally from County Monaghan, if someone is to if someone was to bring me into care in Ireland and they were to place me with a family in Dublin or in Connemara, am I being matched culturally? Is my culture the same, the culture of someone from Monaghan, or or even just the fact that, I, for example, I speak I speak Irish. Um, very regularly. So a lot of people in the room probably have no interest in Irish. So this idea of culture being about your nationality or even about your ethnic group is, is I suppose, quite contested. Um, so for example, these young people, some of them were placed with, so sorry, I should say in the study, I identify the young people as being from regions as opposed to countries. Because there's such a small population of them in Ireland, I didn't want to say a young person from the Democratic Republic of Congo said this, because that person could potentially be identifiable to people who work in the field. So I would have said young people who are from West Africa, or East Africa, Central Africa, Asia, and so on. So some of the young people were placed with, other, with carers from that region, so from West Africa. Some were placed with carers from the same country, but of a different ethnicity, or the same country, but a different religion. Or some were placed with um, a family where the, maybe the, the mother was Irish, but the father was from um, an African country. So it's very hard to say, are they culturally matched or are they not culturally matched? So I suppose what I have done here is I've talked about placements with ethnic minority carers versus placement with, with Irish carers. So I'll just give you some of the quotations that I have. So this young person was placed with a carer of the same nationality. So he said, you can talk about stuff about Nigeria. She has like more experience than I do in things about Nigeria. I can learn stuff off her. We speak the same language. Okay, so this was seen as very important to this young person that she's from Nigeria, I'm from Nigeria. It seems they were they're from the same ethnic group, they were speaking the same language. So we can, we can communicate, we can understand each other. And this was, was seen as being of significance. And then, on the other hand, young people tended to, often tended to emphasize care rather than ethnicity. So this young person said, it doesn't matter to me, for me actually, I can live with anybody. I can live with, my, with any culture. The only thing about it, like, once they respect me for my own belief on whatever I do. So the only thing is, if actually I can get on with the person, and they can get on with me, and they respect me for what, for what respect what I believe or whatever. Okay, so for this young person, it wasn't about, um, it wasn't really about the person's country of origin or their nationality or their ethnicity. It was about the respect that they showed for him. And I guess what's important here is that, you know, some of these young people had, had been placed in maybe Irish family with an Irish couple and then subsequently maybe, maybe there was a placement breakdown and they were moved to a different placement. But this was, this was really what came through this, what's on this slide, that really they, the young people didn't have a very clear sense of you definitely should place people with Irish families or you definitely should place people with families from the same country of origin. They tended to actually, now I guess because they were participating in the study, often young people will agree to participate in the study maybe because they're content in their placement and you know, maybe people who are not content in their placement 
are less likely to maybe be approached by the social worker to take part because of too much going on and so on. So that's important to bear in mind. But the young people tended to be happy with the placement in which they were in. So if they were with an Irish family, they, they tended to think, being with an Irish family is fine. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. I don't need to be with somebody from my culture of origin. And also, if they were with somebody from the country of origin, they tended to think, being with somebody from my country of origin is fine. Um, so I think that was just interesting that the young people often saw the positives in the placement that they were in, as opposed to thinking, well, if I was with an Irish family, this would be better, or if I was with an, you know, a family from uh, my country of origin, this would be better. Okay. There was also a sense that the young people really appreciated the efforts that carers made when the placements were, if you like, cross-cultural. Um, so, sorry, this is actually, just realised, the same quote. But there was, I, I, I think I had another quote I was supposed to put there. So, basically, there was this sense that when uh, carers um, uh, who were, say, Irish, were caring for somebody from an African background, that if the carers made a special effort to, to try to bring their culture into the placement. This was really appreciated. And in fact, it seemed that maybe this was a really important thing for relationship building, that it kind of showed the young person that the, the carer really um, cared for them and really believed in them and was going out of their way to, to try to, you know, um, um, include their culture and ensure that their, their diversity was respected and so on. And I guess th what's important maybe here is that Maybe in some senses there's a danger that if you place somebody with a carer of the same, let's say, nationality, ethnicity, religion, you kind of think, okay, they're placed, their culture is respected, we don't need to do anything more about it. But actually, maybe the carer of that, from that, even though they might be on paper very well matched, that might not necessarily mean that the, the carer is helping the young person with that culture or that, that, that that's necessarily happening. So I think there is a role, like even if the carer is cared for by an ethnic minority family, there's still an importance of addressing the cultural needs of the young person and ensuring that happens. So, for example, within the literature, there's, um, there, there are theories around how people integrate. And in some contexts, a young person could be placed in a family where the family themselves, while they're from the same nationality, they might have decided that, well, we're in Ireland now, so we're going to take the when in Rome do what the Romans do approach, and we're going to try to be as Irish as we can. Whereas maybe this young person doesn't need that. Maybe they need to know more about their culture and to, to learn more about it, and to, for example, to keep their language and so on. So I think just being aware of, of that, that it's not so, so simple, I guess. Okay, so in terms of communication, um, this young person said, I'd love to meet people like who could speak my language really like that. Because like, it's different from English. When you speak your own language, you could say certain things, like you know, funny things that you can't say in English. And then another participant said, sorry. Like when I came new to give me something, I didn't say thank you. I didn't even say please because I'm not used to it. So in this person's country, country of origin, for example, if you're sitting at the, the dinner table and you're saying you want the salt, this person would say, give me the salt. And the, he was giving the example that the carer he was with would have thought, that's really rude. Like, why doesn't this person respect me? They're not saying please, they're not saying thank you. Whereas he then learned that actually just in Ireland, people expect you to say, can you give me the salt, please, instead of give me the salt. Um, so he was just making the, the point that there can be, this can, I suppose, have an impact on relationships because the carer mightn't understand that this is just a different way of communicating. It doesn't mean that the young person, doesn't necessarily mean the young person doesn't um, respect you. And then in terms of food, this young person said, I think it was like, eat the same food that we eat in Nigeria. That was very nice. It made me think back about Nigeria. So again, young people... Um, appreciated efforts, so if they were in a cross-cultural placement, they appreciated efforts carers made. So one young person compared two placements he'd been in. The first placement had broken down, and he talked about the fact that when he was in that placement, he would cook his own food himself, and that, he didn't, that was fine, he was, he was happy to do that. But the carers would complain about the smell of his food. So it would be a very strong smell and it would be all over the house and the carers would complain about it. Whereas in the second placement, while the carers didn't necessarily like the food he ate and didn't maybe eat it, they were very respectful of it and they didn't complain about those, those kind of little things. So, and in other research that's been done in the UK, food can be, has been seen as a really important 
way of welcoming young people and helping them to feel at home. So even just, you know, having some food there when the young person arrives, maybe that they that might be traditional in their culture, or bringing the young person with you, the carer bringing the young person with them when they're shopping, so that the young person can pick out what they would like to eat. That this can be really important for, for the young person. Okay, so I guess continuity in terms of culture is really important. But this cultural matching, I guess, is not the, but cultural matching is not the only way of achieving this. And I'm not in any way trying to suggest that we don't need to recruit more ethnic minority carers. We certainly do. But I think we have to be realistic as well. And in the context in which we're living, it's going to be very difficult to match on all the different criteria we need to match on. So we need to match on lots of different things like geographical location or um, you know, educational needs of the child. There are loads of different needs. Culture is one of them. It's a very important one. And I think if we're using cross-cultural replacements, there are ways in which um, the culture and the identity of the young person can be um, developed within that context. Um, so it's unlikely that one family will meet all the needs of a young person. OK. So just to look at a, se a second theme then, that of uncertainty. So for the, this was something that came across very strongly in the study. So there was uncertainty in, in a lot of different respects. So firstly, the impact of asylum seeking. So these young people were generally going through the asylum process. And they didn't know what the outcome of their application for asylum would be. They were fearful of, for example, deportation. They were fearful of what would happen to them when they turned 18. Um, they were worried about having to attend the interviews um, for the asylum process, where they would be questioned about why they'd come to the country and so on. It's possible that some of them had been, indeed probable, that some of them had been told to tell particular stories um, when they come, came into the country. Um, so some of them were probably living a certain life that wasn't the true life. And in, in fact, in some situations, it can be the case that a young person is told by a smuggler or a trafficker, you need to tell this story in order to get refugee status. Uh, and in fact, if they had told the true story, they, prob they may have got refugee status anyway. But sometimes they're living this kind of in between two um, lives, if you like, in the stories that they have to tell. Um, and obviously then there are situations where the young people have come from really traumatic backgrounds and they're carrying that with them um, within, within their, their placements. So this can have obviously knock-on um, consequences for placements. So for example, there was one, one a social worker who was interviewed um, for, the, for the research talked about a family with whom she worked where the, the, everything seemed to be going really well and then all of a sudden the young person was displaying really difficult behaviour and the carer was like, what, what's going on? Why is this young person suddenly changed? And it seemed to be around the, the interview for the refugee status was coming up and the young person was really anxious about it um, and what they were going to say and so on. So it, I suppose it can have a huge um, impact on, on the placement. And I guess one of the important things to say about that as well is that in terms of relationship building, if we're to see foster care as being about relationships, if young people are living in a context where they don't know whether they'll be allowed to remain in the country and the carers are caring for young people whom they don't know whether they'll be allowed to stay in the country or not, the development of attachments or strong relationships with the, the young people can be quite difficult in, in, in that particular context. And if the young person has experienced a lot of disruption in their relationships previously, they may now be at a point where they're like, okay, I'm not going to invest myself in another relationship because this relationship probably won't last because I'm probably not going to be allowed to stay here. And this, I suppose, links in a little bit with the second point here around distrust. And we've heard, actually, I think almost every presenter today has talked about distrust. Um, and I think there are, there are multiple reasons why these young people might not trust um, foster carers and social workers. Um, and this has a huge impact, obviously, on, on placements. And I guess you know, in any situation of foster care, you might have a young person who doesn't trust, and you might have a young person who doesn't, you know, doesn't talk to the carer, obviously, about the, the reason why they came into care, for example. But I guess the difference here is that often in those contexts, you have, you know, the foster care has been told a certain amount of information that the social worker has. So they have information about the family background. They have some information that they can pass on to the foster care. The foster care has some sense of what went on in this young person's life. Whereas actually in the, in, the con in the context of separated children, often the young person arrives, they're 
really silent about what has happened in their country of origin or why they're here, and they don't tell anything. And actually, so you then have a situation where you have a carer looking after a young person. So if you can imagine you're a carer and there's someone living in your house and you actually don't know anything about them, that's quite, like that's, I think that would be difficult for anyone um, to, to be able to cope with that. So I think that's a, a really important thing that impacts on, on placements. And I guess what I would say around the issue of distrust, I think one of the important things is to have a sense of why the young person um, mightn't trust you. And if you have a sense of why the distrust is there, then that can probably help to, to, to build relationships with them and to eventually let trust develop. And then the third point is around transitioning from family care. So Patricia earlier mentioned the fact that when young people turn 18, they move into the direct provision system unless they already have their, their refugee status. Um, so for a lot of these young people in foster care, that was what was facing them at 18. And obviously, in a context where you know, their peers at 18 are you know, looking forward to moving out of home, perhaps, or going to college, or finishing school, and so on, these young people often are not permitted to, to go to college. Um, they, you know, they don't know what's going to happen. They're going to be moved into direct provision. They might be moved out of the geographical location they're living in and so on. So it has a huge impact, again, on the, on the placement. Okay, so just some quotes in relation to, to these themes. So this, this was a carer, actually, who said, terrifying, heartbreaking to even think that I could lose one of my kids. They're my kids. As I said, the Irish government gave me these kids to look after, but they didn't expect me to fall in love with them and to become part of the family in a very short period of time. And then in terms of this idea around silence and the silence of the young person, these carers said, we make a point of trying not to delve into their past. What we say to them is, look, you know, if there are any issues that come up for you as a result of what happened in your past then that you really need to talk to us about, we're here. But don't feel that you have to tell us your past. And then very honestly, the carer said, my curious nature would be to ask, well, tell me what has brought you here. But in a sense, we feel that we have to respect their need for privacy. And I think this is something that maybe when recruiting carers, we have to be very mindful of. So if, if social workers are recruiting carers, being very mindful of is this person capable of doing this? Like, is this foster care able to live in this situation where there's a si total silence about what ha happened before? Um, because that's not something that everyone can do. And it's, a, it's actually a huge amount to ask, I guess, of a family. And then in terms of direct provision, this was a young person who had been in foster care and, then, and now was living in direct provision. And she said, nobody will come to you even if you're sick. Nobody will come to your room to ask you, are you okay? Even if they didn't see you for the whole day, nobody cares. I just sit in my room and I cry and cry and cry. Okay. So in terms of, if we were to see then that relationships are at the heart, if you like, of foster care, what are the challenges in relation to separated children? So just to summarize some of these. So we have the general challenges associated with relationship building for the general population of children in care. Okay, so they're, they're there anyway. Then we have this, for me, I feel that there's this idea of them spending this time initially in residential care, that that leads to some challenges then when they move into foster care. So it's another disruption. So the young person has, you know, experienced something in their country of origin, left their country of origin, perhaps had trauma on the journey to the, to the new country, has arrived and has found the safe place, which is the residential care unit, and then they have to move again to, to, to foster care, which I think can be difficult. The age of entry into foster care. So the fact that these young people are entering foster care at you know, 16 or 17, in many cases, years of age. So that can be, I suppose, quite challenging for them. Um, the cultural differences, so we've talked about some of them. So around things like communication, religion, uh, language, values, and so on. Um, the silence, secrecy, and distrust, which I've mentioned then the asylum process and threat of deportation, and then finally the idea of turning 18. And the, 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 you know, obviously turning 18 for children in care can be problematic for many children, but I think it has an added layer for this particular group. So then just some suggestions, I guess, about building relationships in this kind of context. So I think we need uh, carers who are really emotionally self-aware. So for example, the carer who I quoted earlier, who was able to admit that 
well, my curious nature would be to, I really want to ask him why you came here, what's your story? But the fact that she was able to hold that back and able to, to sit with the young person and know that, well, that's not in the best interest of the young person, I think was really important. Whereas there was another carer in the study who said something like, um, well, don't worry, I'll get it out of him eventually. And I suppose that kind of approach didn't seem just quite as, as, as useful in terms of building a relationship with the young person. And probably, ironically, the, the person who is saying I won't ask is probably the one who will get it out of him eventually. Um, and then providing practical assistance. So again, having carers who are happy to, to focus on the practical things, that maybe the young person isn't going to open up. So maybe some, a foster care is going into the, to the process of being a foster care thinking, I'll be there for the young people, they'll open up to me, I'll be able to support them, I'm very good at listening and so on, which is all really important. But actually, maybe the carer needs to just provide practical assistance help the young person get into a school, advocate for the young person, liaise with social workers, and so on. Provide emotional support when sought. Treat the young people like their own children, not trying to obviously replace birth families, advocating for the young people. Showing an interest in their culture, and the, the idea that Anne had earlier about respectful curiosity, I think that's a really interesting idea. And again, for, for practitioners as well, um, trying to come to, to, to understand the culture, having this sense of respectful curiosity about it, I think is really useful. And that they're proactive in relation to it. Can respond appropriately to experiences of racism. So, you know, not just dismissing that. Um, and actually, just in relation to the, the issue around culture, there was another example of a carer who had two young people living with them, and the young people were you know, doing really well in the placement, and they were really co seemed to be very content um, where they were living and so on. But the, the carer in her interview said, oh, you know, th they're really integrated into life in Ireland, they're not really interested in their culture. And actually, the young person, when, when one of the young people was interviewed, he said, oh, I'd like to, to, to learn, and I'll quote, a wee bit more about my culture. Okay, so he was speaking as though he was an Irish person with his, his wee bit more, but he, he actually wanted to know a bit more about his culture. So I think that can be um, important. Allowing si silence, someone who can support young people about the uncertainty surrounding the asylum process and who can respond to the coexistence, I guess, of vulnerability and resilience. That the young people are not all vulnerable. There's so much resilience in them. Um, and can respond to young people who want to be attached or young people who actually want to live in their home but be quite detached from them. So just to finish just with a few kind of questions maybe to ponder or to discuss. So what does care provision, so foster care or residential, aim to achieve in the context of the asylum process? How can meaningful relationships be built in the context of this distrust and uncertainty? How best can carers be supported to work with ethnic minority children, including those in the asylum process? And should the general cohort of foster carers be used, or should foster carers be recruited specifically um, for these uh, young people? Okay, thank you.